Thank God it's Monday, an opportunity for a fresh start. Welcome to Business Morning on Channels Television. I'm Ini John Mekwa. And I'm Ladi Williams. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's take a look at the news now. Oil prices were a little change in early Asian trade as an unpassing um, um, uh, talks among key producers to raise output in the coming months kept supplies tight, offsetting concerns about coronavirus impact on the global economy. Brent crude for September fell four cents to $75.51 a barrel, while U.S. West Texas intermediate crude for August was at $74.57 a barrel, up one cent. Oil prices slumped last Tuesday after OPEC Plus did not reach an agreement to increase output from August. This was uh, because the United Arab Emirates rejected a proposed eight-month extension to OPEC Plus output curbs. Front month uh, WTI Crude futures posted their sixth weekly gain last week after a bullish uh, report from the U.S. Energy Information Administration uh, showed U.S. crude and gasoline stocks fell while gasoline demand reached its highest since 2019. In response to higher oil prices, U.S. energy firms added oil and natural gas rigs for a second week in a row. You know, Ladi, uh, the uncertainty around the talks with OPEC Plus is yeah. still lingering. It still lingers, yeah. How long that would take and... Now countries will now have to take personal decisions as exactly. individually regarding output. How to yeah. Go. yeah, and we really hope that's what they can do with it. And we yeah. see the price keeps uh, inching up exactly. as that uh, continues. Exactly. And it, might, it might look good for some countries at the short term, but we don't know the consequences in the long term. That's the problem. Mm. So we keep watching that space. Yeah. So back here in Nigeria, ahead of inflation figures for the month of June, which is expected later this week from the National Bureau of Statistics, economic advisory firm. Financial derivatives company expects Nigeria's inflation to climb back to June at 18.1%. The projected figure would represent a 0.17% pickup from the 17.97% lower rate recorded in May. FDC attributes the upward inflation forecast to rising global food prices, the impact of inflationary pressures from other major economies, as well as the recent adjustment of foreign exchange rates by the central bank on the 24th of May, the Bureau of Statistics is expected to release the latest monthly inflation report on July the 15th. That's according to information on its website. Meanwhile, Nigeria's foreign exchange reserve is still on the downward spiral as it dropped further by $113.15 million week on week to $33.12 billion as of July the 6th. However, analysts expect improvement in liquidity at the investors and exporters window of the forex market over the medium term due to expected increase on the oil flows in line with the rise in crude oil prices as well as inflows from foreign currency borrowings by the government. And uh, last week, the federal government launched the leather policy. It has a target of $1 billion by 2025. What are the details of this policy? Who are the players in this policy? The Chief Executive Officer of Adeshigmi Company Nigeria Limited, who is also the um, independent consultant on leather and leather products to the Department for International Development, joins us next to speak about that, that Mr. Kola Adeshigmi. He will talk about that with us after the break. Last week, the federal government launched the leather policy with a target of $1 billion by 2025. The event was a formal launch and sensitization workshop on the National Leather and Leather Product Policy Implementation Plan. According to the Vice President, Professor Yomi Shibajo, a study carried out by the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, which projected that the Nigerian leather industry has the potential of not only increasing its earnings by 70%, but also generating over $1 billion by 2025. Well, we have Mr. Kola Adeshigmi, the Chief Executive Officer of Adeshigmi Company, Nigeria Limited. He's also an independent consultant on leather and leather products to the Department for International Development, joining us to share his thoughts on the leather policy. Morning, Thank you sir. so much for joining us, Mr. Adeshigmi. Good to have you. Thank you. So uh, you are active in the leather industry. Um, but it doesn't seem to be a very popular industry. It, we don't hear about it every day in the news. Why um, is that? Are we major players as Nigeria? Are we major players in the industry, or are we just trying to get something out of it? We have a stake in the industry as a, as a country, particularly in Africa, where the major producer of leather and being exported to even foreign countries. But the problem is the government has not been given 
attention property to the industry. That's why we will, we will not be having the, the race stops of So with industry. this launch now, yeah. uh, do you see, is this the attention you this, think this the industry like deserves the attention or right needs? Now, yeah. Yes, we'll be crying for the policy for quite a while and then be working as early to make sure that the policy comes on, on ground so that we can have a template to work with. Not Thank God the present government administration has done the needful to make sure that this policy is being addressed. Mm. So um, looking at, you know, the industry now, you know, we have there are a lot of byproducts, you know, when it comes to leather. How, how would you say, you know, Nigeria is doing on that front, you know, exporting, you know, finished goods? Um, in Nabasa today, if you go to a rare market to see a volume of shoes being produced, that leather goods, in shoes, bags, wallet, horses, souvenirs, and they are being exported. Averagely, within a week, you have a million naira intakes from there. That's from Abba? From Abba. Only Abba. And if you get to Kano, there's a concession in Kofu and Bai, where you have, because of the culture of the Northerners, some of them, they don't wear cut shoes, as we do down south here. You just slip on shoes, sandals. Reason because if you go to their houses, you have to remove your shoes. So removing the cut shoes gives you a lot of stress. So they just put a slip on sure. in. Okay. So, okay, but how do we relate the Abba guys that you're talking to, yeah. to this policy? Because also in 2018, there was mm -hmm. another policy. Mm -hmm. there, was a, there was a leather policy also launched in 2018, mm -hmm. and this is 2021. Now, how do we relate the reality, which is the Abba guys you're talking about, yes. and the ceremony, like this policy that is being launched, and, uh, you know, $1 billion that is being projected, how do we relate them? The, the ABAP policy, the work for ABA shoemakers, they are really intuitive method of produce production. But we still have some larger industries, too, okay. that produces en mass. Because their own, the production in ABA is more of makeshift. 10 PS per day, but it's not in volumes because they don't have the capacity to have the equipment. But with, it, with this policy now, the, 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 value, the value chain will now be closed somehow. Where we have the skin collectors, the leather manufacturers, the shoe manufacturers, and other aspects. Do we have active regulators who consciously and intentionally connect the ABBA group of guys to the policy group? Do we have it? Or we just hope that it will connect? Sure. You know, what happened is, in 2014, I was at a program on this growth and employment in states, which we have, we have to move to Abba and bring all these shoemakers together and form them to clusters. So from there, it's a day fairly project for four years, thinking that we want to increase their capacity, make sure that the finished products they have can compete with the, uh, with the external world. The SON, play a lot of major role on, on stand, standard organization in Nigeria, looking at the method process of production and looking at the quality of the shoes. So it is this parameter we are using to regulate the ABA. So we have a LEPMAS, that is Leather um, Production uh, Association in ABA. They have, they have, we, we have to teach, we train them on corporate, corporate entity and how to run the, their programs, taking them through Cooperative, uh, cooperative ideas and how to really actualize what can bring them profit. And trading and working with other external organizations too. Nelson Bank played a major role too. Bank of the Rest played a major role. And we have GIZ. GIZ. We work together and make sure that these people are, be, are being regulated. Okay. Well, the, at the meeting, the Minister of Science and Technology said the policy could generate $900 you know, million dollars if well harnessed, you yes. know. How would you uh, say it can actually be harnessed well at this point? My major area is that we think when we make pronouncement, we should do the, we should do the talk. There are still some lapses to generate that um, amount, but we is doable. We can even go beyond that if we have all the all the, all the levels that are supposed to be to be in place, the such facilities. This is a major problem for us in the industry. When there's no power, the, the, the factory runs down. So if, there is, if all these facilities are there, 
there's, we, are, we can even generate more than what, what he has mentioned. So the same old problems, basically. Yeah, infrastructure. So it's not just a bar that these things are being produced. No. I mean, when you talk of heights and skin, I think mostly it's from the north. Yes. Okay, so what's the coordination from the raw material, you know, to where we see the finished products? How, who, how does it go? The Ilea, Ilea is not coming now. Millions of cows, cattle will be slaughtered. So they are, they are, the value chain is from the skin collectors. They are bacteria, that, that, that's where the animal has been slaughtered. Then we have the skin collectors, we will now take it to the tanneries. In the tanneries, we have those who select grading, look at the quality, the texture of the, of the, of the skins before they go into the process of tanning, tanning. And that process is a chemical process. But well, do we have the skills, sorry, do we have the skills absolutely, we for have the skills. each? Do we have them trained or we're just doing apprenticeship no, and... No, we have, we have an institution in Zaria that's nihilist. The University of Leather Science and Technology. I lectured there for a couple of years. Okay. A couple of years where we're training graduates in leather manufacture in, from even right from the, from slaughtering to the end product. We have a program on diploma, HND, and certificate. And then we have other aspect of it, which is the footwear manufacturing and leather goods. So that's the, that major institute is really doing wonderful things in making sure we have the capacity to, to maintain the, All right. the trend. So in 2013, the industry generated $921 million you know, for the government. So I, I want to know, what is it generating right now? Um, for now, I've not gotten the figure. But is it higher or lower? Is it higher? It's going to be higher. Okay. But the only problem is the COVID-19 has been a drawback. So I'm not be expecting something much more higher than that. Okay. What about the issue of exporting raw materials? Yes. Where are we there? Do we have enough for domestic use? Can we generate uh, foreign direct income from it? Of course we, we can. Of course we can. Okay. Mm. Well, uh, the what about the taste of Nigerians? I mean, I don't think a lot of people are proud of wearing clothes, I mean, made shoes, in, made in shoes that have boldly written made in Nigeria. <laughs> How's that going? Uh, you see, the issue is that during your Basidia regime, it's been being, being a lead factor in that area that we should wear made in Nigeria. And exhibitions were here and there in the textile industry, the fashion industry, in the shoe industry, because the shoe industry or the footwear industry. Now it's now aligned to the fashion industry. But we you know our, our complex here, yeah? we don't see Italian made there. Mm. I'll tell you a secret. Some shoes are made in Abba, and they put in Italian made there. And they, they are brought to, their, to our, all these boutiques here, mm. which we are calling their, their well, Is it because of complex or because of the quality of the product? Quality, mm, yes. But I would, I, I would address the issue that is this, the complex much more super, 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 the, the quality. Okay, so you just want to wear, you know, international International shoes. Look at my basically. shoe. Unfortunately, <laughs> we <laughs> 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 can't see that. <laughs> Those Nigerian-made uh, shoes. Well, well, you should. I mean, you are in the, in, you're in the industry. Yeah. yeah. I don't think you have a lot of choice. I have to. <laughs> to promote the industry. Exactly. Yeah. But do you see a conscious effort to reduce, you know, exporting, you know, leather at this point? Um, the government brought in export expansion scheme grant, which is to assist the industry. But the conscious effort of the company is of the government to reduce exportation is handled by the custom industry, the customs department. But we still want to play with the government to give room to this industry to bring in more foreign exchange by export. Because if you look at the whole economy, leather happens to be a cash cow to replace all in the, the, the very, all. very not so popular cash cow, I must say. Yeah, because we're, we're looking <laughs> at because diversifying the economy, right? Yes. Now, so. What that's why the economy leather is, is, is a short bet for us. It's a short bet for us. Because if we've been having the slogan after all, this the whole area is leather and leather industry. So, so I that's guess what we, the, the launch of this uh, leather yeah. policy 
that uh, there'll be a lot of attention. But how attractive is the industry to the youths, you know, to get employment and all that? How attractive mm -hmm. is it? If you go to Kano now, you see the youth are really crazy about it. Shoemaking? Yes. Mm. Initially, it was more of that tendency where I want to go and learn how to make shoes. When I got to Zaria, 1994, I had to impress on them. There is no average person that will walk out without putting up a shoe. Mm. Our president will not wear his barbaric guy without putting a shoe. All of us here will have a pair of shoes. So it's an avenue for us to make income. And the, about three years ago, I was on this program of Adam Smith International, that is to train the youths to be fully employed. To, to my, at least, amazingly now, you see, all these amajiris on the street now have been brought into this program. We call it Bafita program, a way out. Bafita is a way out. Okay. And this program is, we have to teach them from learning how to even write ABC. And we selected so many areas of competence. Shoemaking, um, the, our phone, mobile phone operating, electric, electrical insulation, welding fabrication. If you see these children, that within three months, they can communicate. It's amazing and it's, 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 it's wonderful. How structured is this? Um, how uh, refined is it? Is it just the crude way of doing it? Or is there conscious efforts to make it you structured know, bring and bring in technology, yeah. mechanization, so that there's faster and a more effective production and better quality? You have to start from somewhere. That's, the, that's the, the concept. Teaching that to use your fingers, your hands to cut, and use your hand to stitch before you start bringing technology and using machines. If you're not properly taught how to undo your, you use your hand to manipulate your hands, how can you operate the equipment too? But we're but getting gradually, yeah, we're point. getting to that level now that yeah. even if, if you get to Zaria now, we have a lot of machines on, on ground for training, even computer aided designs machines. So it sounds right. like youth in the south should move to the north to get employment <laughs> in the leather industry. The, the, the youth, even in, in, the, in, the, in the south, yeah, we have a lot of children doing shoes now. All right, uh, maybe I'll also learn how to you know, <laughs> make knows? shoes. The second stream of income will exactly. be good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Adeshibina Company, Nigeria, and also the independent consultant on leather and leather products to the Department for International Development, Mr. Kola Adeshibi. Thank you so much for sharing your Thank thoughts you with so us much. this morning. Thank you for having on me. On happenings in the leather Thank industry. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah. So we'll just take a short break now. When we come back, we'll have another conversation here on Business Morning and Channel Television. Do stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching Business Morning on Channels Television. Well, there are questions as to the fair value of the Naira. Economists say when oil prices rise and balance of trade is in huge surplus, Naira is stable. Meanwhile, policymakers believe that imported inflation and exchange rates pass through are the inflation catalysts. Well, Michael Ogunremi, an analyst with Chapel Hill Denham, shares his thoughts with us on the Naira. Hello, Michael. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Thanks. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on the fair value of the Naira, especially when you look at the first half of 2021? How would you say the Naira performed? Okay, so to start with, I would say that um, to determine what the fair value of the currency is, um, you need to study what the trend is in an unregulated um, FX market. Okay, um, what, what we currently have in Nigeria is um, the Naira being determined, the fair value of the Naira being determined in the IRE window. So there's a proxy that um, what the Naira value is in the IRE window is um, a fair value estimate for what you know, it should really be. But then again, it's important to cite the caveat that the IRE window is somehow quasi-regulated because you still have you know, a bit of you know, receiving influence in that window. You know, um, but that said, um, we believe, you know, uh, for us at um, Chapel Hill Denham that the fair value of the Naira ranges between 4 and 16 Naira. 
to 480 Naira. And when you compare that to where you know the currency is currently trading, you can say that the Naira is overvalued. Um, a few a few um, days ago, the CBN came out to say that um, the Naira is overvalued by about 10%. We honestly feel that you know it is even way much more than the 10% that the CBN quoted. Um, but in terms of how the Naira performed yet to date, um, um, as of June, um, as of June 2021, Naira lost about 36 basis points. You know, um, when you compare it to you know the raise in the iron even though know, as at December um, 2020, um, 36 basis points is not too significant. We think it's a fair estimate, not so bad. But overall, what we can say is the exchange rate is somewhat elevated, but we think that the volatility has been low, albeit the Naira remains of value. All right, how would you assess the impact of you know, inflation on the Naira in the first half of 2021? And we are expecting uh, the figures for June later this week. Okay, so um, to speak to inflation, um, uh, I'd consider two, two main factors, right? Um, the first would be what exactly is the relationship between um, inflation, domestic inflation, and the prices of imports. And the second factor would be what is the um, stickiness of import in terms of um, what's the import dependence in Nigeria. So to start with, you know, if you look at the market, if you go to the market normally, what you discover is whenever domestic inflation is on the high side, the prices of you know, uh, imported goods that are substitutes to those products are much higher. And I'll give you a very good example. You take the price of rice, for instance. Um, a bag of imported rice is always more expensive than, you know, most times more expensive than the domestic ones, okay? And so whenever you know, the price of rice spikes in markets domestically, importers, um, exporters, importers bringing in rice from abroad sort of, you know, puts extra markup, you know, on their price. So, so that relationship shows that most times you have imported, the prices of imported substitutes being higher than, you know, the local comparables you have in Nigeria. And then you also have the, high import dependency that we have in Nigeria. If you check the Q1 2021 trade report that was released by the NBS, you notice that, I mean, imports continues to expand. Um, and this is, this is, um, um, this was also fostered by the fact that we had COVID in, a, in the system. Regardless of that, we still had the, you know, um, the natural imports. So when you put, put factors together, the fact that we have high import dependency and the fact that we have, you know, um, this um, higher pace of um, inflation for imported products compared to domestic ones. You've noticed that as long as we continue to have domestic inflation in the country, the prices of imported goods will be high. And because we have high import dependence in Nigeria, we will continue to have more pressure on the FX and the Naira you know, for import demand. And that will sort of continue to depreciate the Naira. Mm, unfortunately, so well. In part of the first half of 2021, the Naira depreciated against the U.S. dollar on investors and exporters' window as the country's oil production improved. What were your observations in this area? Okay, um, so it's it's quite an antithesis, right? I mean, so normally the expectation is always that whenever oil, but whenever we have this bullish on oil price, the economy should improve. But we didn't, we didn't really we didn't really see that, you know, um, recently. Um, Currently, oil prices, you know, um, the bull run we have in oil prices is trending towards you know, historical peaks. Um, what we had in you know, um, um, 2017, thereabouts. So, and there are speculations that it could hit hundred, you know, hundred dollar before the end of the year. How true that is, I really can't say. It's an opinion from some school of thoughts. However, the reason why we have not had, you know, um, a significant impact from, you know, the bullish run we have in price now um, is due to some factors. And the first would be that you know, Nigeria is not producing as much as it used to produce historically. Um, um, prior to the pandemic, you know, Nigeria's oil production was within the range of 1.8 million barrels per day to 2.2 million barrels per day. But currently we're producing about 1.4, 1.5 million barrels per day. And so despite the fact that we have you know, um, high oil prices, we don't have, we're not producing enough to, you know, tap in on that game. And of course, this is also because of the fact that you know, there are um, OPEC quotas in, in, in place. But regardless, you know, our production is low and we're not able to generate as much as we would have 
The other factor is that has sort of um, prevented you know, the positive oil trajectory we currently have on the Nigerian economy is the fact that there were unplanned expenditures you know, because of COVID. And um, it's quite logical. When you have an external shock in an economy, you have to sort of incur some sort of unplanned expenditures, okay? And most of this expenditure you know, were financed in, in dollars, which would definitely be paid from our reserves. That is another reason why you know, we didn't really have much impact you know, of um, oil price in the economy. And then you also have CBN interventions in the markets. Between January and June, you know, the CBN intervention in the IE &E market was about um, $1 billion. And that is, that is quite, you know, um, maybe compared to the size of uh, external reserve, it might look not to say that, but it is, it is, it is something you know, to also um, 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 point out. So the impact of these three factors you know, put together you know, has prevented the positive trends that we have in the prices now impacting, you know, um, put the external reserve, put the Naira, and put the economy in general. All right, All right Michael, but wh where do you see the Naira, you know, in the second half of this year? Um, so to be to be honest, it's it's hard to tell, um, but um, there are factors, you know, um, I can use to, I can consider to say, okay, I think the Naira, you know, will play within this region. So the first would be that, as long as we continue to have, if we if we continue to have this bull run oil price till the end of the year, I think it's good for the naira. Um, that's that's number one. Number two, if we um, sort of have improvement in foreign portfolio, um, FPIs flow to the IMP window. I think that's that's it. that's that's another good one. Um, um, besides those two factors, you know, if you know the. Um, government is able to expedite the sale of the euro bonds, the planned $6.1 billion euro bond, and the CBN is able to get those money into the external reserve coffers as soon as possible. And they can also sell, you know, supply liquidity to the market as soon as possible. I do think that we can, we might see some sort of appreciation in the Naira. Um, I wouldn't want to put a figure to it because Naira is very volatile. I, I wouldn't want to put a figure to it, but there is some sort of you know, upside we can see in the Naira if you know these three factors you know, come into play. Well, in this first half, I think last month, the CBN adopted the NAFEX rate. What impacts have you observed from that action? Okay, um, so I think that the NAFEX um, convergence that was done by the CBN is or was a step in the right direction. Um, it's, 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 it's been a long time calling, and I think that it was good that they um, take that route. Um, in terms of what the impact is, if you look at the I and E people, um, the average turnover you know, between January and June, you know, was, um, was, was within the range of um, 70 billion. But as after June, um, after June, all the way down to after May, rather after May, all the way down to to to, to June, the average term price was about one point six billion. So when you speak, you know, when I if, if I'm to speak to the numbers, I'll most likely say that turnover has improved, you know, relatively because of the convergence, and it's pure logic um, because of the fact that we don't have um, 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 a dichotomy in the windows. You don't have people considering whether to go to the CBN and gets FX at the official rates or stay in the I and E and gets their FX. It has sort of improved, you know, turnover in the I and E. So you have people saying, as long as I'm indifferent, you know, between both markets, it's the same rate the CBN will give to me anyways. Let me just play in the I and E. Window. So I, I think that's one of the, that's, that's the explanation behind why we have that improved turnover in the I and E. Window. But if you come to the parallel markets, I mean, you don't really see that trend there. And that's because of the fact that there is still a, a very wide you know, parallel market premium currently you know, obtainable in, in, in the market. And so um, to, to, to put it in, in to put it in um, to summarize, I'd say that the impact of the NAFEX, NAFEX convergence is, is much more biased towards the I and E window. We've not really seen you know, a lot of it in the um, parallel market. And of course, you, you'd agree with me that more of the demand that we currently have for FX in Nigeria is, you know, is biased towards the parallel market. And if you consider that, we can say that we've not seen as much impact overall you know, of the NAFEX convergence in Nigeria. 
All right, Michael, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and expectation on the Naira for the second half of the year. Michael Ogunremi is an analyst with Chapel Hill Denham. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having me. So we're still talking about AFEX now. Willie Bong has a review of what happened last week in the AFEX market. Hello, Will. Good morning, Ini. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be back on Monday. <laughs> um, the Forex exchange market, so uh, like we were discussing with um, Michael, closed last week with Nigeria's currency depreciating across official and unofficial segments despite the injection of $210 million by the central bank. And Nigeria's FX reserves can sustain its decline. It's now down over $110 um, million as, as at last week. We can see that sports uh, forwards and futures in the week ended uh, July the 9th was down, um, was at a total turnover of $663.04 million. And we see that that represents a decrease of 13.60%. Um, That's the decrease that we have seen. This week on week decrease was due mainly to the 6.2% and the 31.0% uh, decrease in the forwards and futures volume. In particular, at the investors and uh, exporters uh, window, the total volume of transactions carried out last week decreased by almost 12% to stand at $518.1 million uh, from $588.54 million traded in the previous week. Similarly, at the NAFEX window, the Naira fell against the dollar by 54 cover to 411 point. Uh, 28, 411 uh, Naira, 28 over to a dollar against the previous week where the Naira traded at 410 Naira, 74 cover to a dollar, representing a 0.13% decrease. However, in the parallel market, the, the Naira, the rates remained, the exchange rate remained unchanged against the dollar. But to give us more insights about the happenings in the markets, we have Constance Onya, a fixed income dealer at Access Bank. Good morning, Constance. Morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming. So, um, Constance, could, some analysts have said that we should expect we to improve liquidity in the investors and exporters window over the medium term, due to expectations of increased oil inflows in line with the rise in crude oil prices and uh, government borrowings, foreign currency borrowings. That we'll see some liquidity in the system. What's your take on this? Okay, so um, my take is that activity has, improved, has actually improved a lot in the um, FX space. And what we continue to see is the CBN trying to intervene as much as possible. Uh, the fortnight um, auctions are held on um, Friday, so a huge um, in participation in it. And we expect that the um, CBN, like you mentioned, will continue to intervene with the SPIs as well, continue to inflow dollars and continue to speak with these counterparties. It's really been challenging with the dollar transactions lately, but um, let's hope that our CBN is able to carry along and able to fit in, in where most of this is desired. Oh, that, thank you so much. What, but what's a quick one? What's your outlook for the fixed income market this week? Okay, so for this week, we have a total of $561 billion on the bond maturity. We have an OMO maturity of about $20 billion. And then we also have NCB auction coming up on Wednesday, where they expect to roll over about $108 billion as well. So this week, total about $800 to $900 issue will be coming into the system. And then we expect the interbank to uh, remain at about 8 to 10% levels on the borrowing side. So we expect the market to be bullish, seeing that there's a lot of liquidity coming into the system for the week. Thank you so much, Constance, for your input on the program. That was Constance Onya, a fixed income dealer at Access Bank. Now let's check out the equities market, where the local boss ended the... Um, the week, last week on a negative note, as profit-taking activities in the last two trading sessions wiped off the week's gains and pushed the market into the red, largely driven by sell-offs in Etal Africa and Dangote Sugar. The all-share index, we can see, was depreciated by 0.57% and making falling and close to close at 37,994.19 points, falling below the 38,000 level, and the market cap also fell by 0.62%.
and also driving it down below the 20 trillion mark. Uh, this means that listed equities lost about 123 billion naira in the course of last week. Although the NGX uh, closed negative week on week, we see that the financial sector, that's the Fugas, the banks, also known as the tier one banks, appreciated in market capitalization by almost 3% to close the week at almost 3 trillion naira. The Fugas, we know that's the First Bank, UBA, GT Holdings, Access Bank, and Zenith Bank, four of them listed appreciated in price week on week, which is a boost to the market. The activity, let's, let's look at the activity chart. We see that the volume uh, rose by 32% up, and it was at 1.34 billion uh, units. And the value declined. The value was the only one that declined by about 14.2% uh, and all traded in over 21,500 transactions, an increase from the previous trading week. Similarly, sectoral performance, we see that the banking, oil and gas, insurance, industrial indexes recorded gains. Consumer goods was the sole decliner, and this was largely due to the sell-offs observed in the stocks of Dangote Sugar. To talk more about the activities in the equities market is David Adonri, a stockbroker at High Cap Securities Limited. Good morning, David. Thank you. Good morning. Happy to be with you today. It's good to be with you too, too David. Um, David, we just jump right in. With the moderation in the prices of bellwether stocks last week, do you think investors will take advantage of this and take positions ahead of half year's earnings announcement? Yes, uh, I agree with you because uh, uh, last week uh, there were several declines in the equities and market. Uh, making a lot of stocks uh, very attractive against the backdrop that uh, from this week we'll start uh, expecting uh, uh, half-year results hitting the market. And some of the companies uh, at half-year usually uh, make distributions to investors. So that uh, is a factor that is likely to increase demand for equity. But uh, in addition to equities, uh, there are also opportunities emerging in the debt uh, uh, section of the market because the primary market for debt uh, has also been very active with uh, interest rates of new issue uh, getting higher. So we actually have uh, a capital market that is firing on uh, both sides. The candle is now being burned at two ends all to the benefit of the investors. Oh. So looking at uh, this week, uh, where we are now, I would wish to believe that uh, the demand for equities will be high, and so that should drive up uh, the price uh, of equities. Oh, that is good to know, Mr. Dory. Thank you so much. Um, that's a way have any, yeah. as Mr. Dory has said. We're driving the yeah, we're very optimistic about the week. I join in your optimism, and uh, <laughs> perhaps I'll take your peep and uh, look into the equities a bit. Though, Definitely. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Will. We'll take a break now. When we come back, we'll do our opening call to London. Do stay with us. Welcome back. We head to London now, where Juliana is standing by. Hello, Juliana. Not a very good morning in the UK. After the shootout heartbreak. Yeah, good morning, um, Ine. It's yeah, it's it's devastating, devastating uh, morning um, across the UK, or particularly England, because it was England um, who lost against um, Italy in yeah. a pretty excruciating way. Penalties. It was yeah, certainly um, heartbreaking. I think you can feel um, the weight, the sheer weight of the loss um, around London at the moment. Gareth Southgate, the England manager, is right now um, giving in his first live televised um, news uh, conference. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty awful after 55 years. Um, a lot of people were expecting England to bring it home. Sadly, that's not um, the case. Um, I'm sure you must have all seen it. Our viewers have. There's been so much racial abuse um, targeted yeah. towards the black players, which has certainly uh, put a more of a dark cloud around the proceedings. Uh, the Prime Minister's spoken out about it. Uh, the Home Secretary, pretty potentially as well as um, the FA uh, president, um, Prince William. So, yes, it's pretty sad and a bad way um, to end the match, considering um, there's just been so much viral um, uh, hatred. Yeah, not very good at all, apart from 
the sadness of losing the match. Well, let's move on now. Uh, reports say that over 70% of CFOs expect to boost capital expenditure and hiring over the year ahead, the highest level in almost seven years. Is this ahead of Freedom Day? It is ahead of Freedom Day, and this is um, a great report. It's Deloitte um, who have uh, conducted this survey. It was conducted uh, about a month ago, uh, speaking to uh, chief financial officers as well as um, CEOs of top countries in the UK, and they're ready. Um, I think there's been a shift, a shift of sentiment from uh, pandemic lows, uh, pre-Brexit lows. Uh, firms weren't sure about um, the certainty going forward, how they were going to um, work around the exit from Europe and then, of course, all of the halt that we had um, in um, the pandemic uh, period. Well, that's over. The economy is starting to tick again. We're expecting Prime Minister Boris Johnson later today to announce that, yes, Freedom Day will go ahead on um, the 19th of July, which means businesses can start um, opening uh, to the full extent. Companies can start hiring, they can start investing. We've already seen uh, this year it's been a big year for acquisitions and IPOs on the London Stock Exchange. So, yeah, this is certainly a great news, a much-needed boost considering the morale in the country is so low right now. Yeah, well, I trust you to bring it up with some of your good news. Uh, but what else are we looking out for this week, apart from the speech from uh, the Prime Minister? Yeah, we've got two important dates this week on the calendar. The first one is um, tomorrow. We're going to be looking at inflation um, data. Inflation currently stands at 2.1% above the Bank of England's target. The consensus is it will come in at about 2.3%. Uh, there has been fears about inflation and whether or not monetary policy, which has been loose, is going to be tightened. Um, we expect not. On Friday, we've got GDP figures uh, for the month of um, May showing that GDP uh, grew much slower than what was anticipated, which means the recovery that we've all been boasting about is ongoing, but it's not as swift and as fast as people would have liked. So I doubt there'll be any moves uh, from the Bank of England uh, to, to try and curl back quantitative easing, even if um, inflation is much higher than 2.3% as expected tomorrow. And then on Thursday, uh, we get that all employment, all important unemployment data. Unemployment in this country currently stands, I believe, at about 4.7%. That's expected to remain um, unchanged, though once the furlough scheme starts winding down in September, it, it's certainly going to be much higher. All right, well, we'll be looking forward to those data and reaction in the markets ahead in the week. Well, thank you so much, Juliana. Enjoy the rest of your day. And don't forget, 1.30 Business Incorporated will have you on again. Thank you. So it was a Red Friday. I don't know about the weekend, but I sure hope it's a Green Monday, laddie. <laughs> yeah, anyway, it went to Rome. <laughs> <laughs> yesterday, but the oh, market please. is green. <laughs> oh, do leave Juliana out of this, please. <laughs> I know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite sad. But yeah, Bitcoin is in the green this morning. Ethereum and uh, major altcoins all in the green. Uh, market cap, $1.43 trillion, about 2.79%. At a 24-hour volume, $55.23 billion traded in the total crypto market. Bitcoin dominance is uh, there at 45.25%, uh, still ranging in that region and we'll have a price of Bitcoin at 8 a.m., $34,405, about 2.80%. Uh, volume traded in this morning, $21.84 billion. That's a kind of a difference, you know. Most mornings we have about $50 billion traded, but today we have 21. And uh, looking at the four-hour chart, uh, it's still ranging there. We see it up at the, at the upper Bollinger Band still uh, on that critical support, the 30K region. Price of Ethereum, $2,157, up 3.19%. Uh, uh, traded this morning, $15.42 billion traded in Ethereum. Top alts by market cap, they're all in the green. BNB topping that counter, up 6.11%. Uh, and Cardano, of Cardano, $1.37, up uh, 3%. And XRP, XRP is doing well, up 5.57%. Uh, let's bring in uh, Ulum Day additional. Oh, okay, we don't have a limit day right now. Uh, top uh, five gainers, Tell, one cent, up 25.38%. We have SNX at uh, $13, up 22.84%. And I noticed this morning, I see some uh, 
uh, uh, exchange uh, tokens actually doing well with uh, some DeFi coins that uh, OK, OK be there, $10 up 13%. And Aave, we have Aave, $320, uh, uh, 47 cents up 10.94%. Top losers, STX, the leading that counter, uh, down about 5%. Atom, $14, down uh, 3%. Mana, Mana Decentraland at 71 cents, down 2%. And uh, GRT and QNT. So the market is not looking bad, but we still have that uh, massive uh, grayscale unlock coming for Bitcoin. We don't know where that's uh, going to take the price, but traders are anticipating, uh, you know, what could happen. Uh, so some might be on the sideline to just, you know, watch how the, you know, unlock goes. So it's it's the countdown uh, right now for uh, grayscale, and uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, traders, act analysts, actually predicting that the price will go down, but Bitcoin is in critical support at around the 30K uh, range. We have that other support at 28,000. Uh, let's uh, bring in Olumide Adishon now. Hello, Olumide. Hello, Ladi. Good morning. Happy Monday. Good morning. Great to have you, Olumide. So we have that massive uh, grayscale unlock coming. Uh, what should traders be doing right now? Uh, I think um, traders should um, be cautious uh, because there are a lot of things um, happening around the market. First of all, the dollar is um, gaining momentum. And um, recent um, markets suggest that the world's uh, most powerful economy considering tightening the economy. So at one point, the risky assets might feel uh, drying cash flows. Then another thing is that um, I think um, institutional investors are getting tired about the range, price range occurring in these crypto assets. So they are moving to more real use case scenario. And that's why we see um, crypto assets like um, Axie Infinity doing a weekly gain of more than 120%, because these are assets that people use for gains. So they are moving towards real case assets. And also, you look at the fact that um, and we just concluded um, Copa America final, Argentina's fan token had a return of more than 400 percent suggests that investors are looking more at real case scenarios. But uh, still, the market is still uh, at a very parabolic situation. But we expect that uh, later this year, uh, things will then uh, stabilize. But we're not going to see uh, that running that happened um, in the first uh, quarter happening again. It's very unlikely that that is. All right, but, but where do you see the price of Bitcoin going forward? Yes, I think, um, to be fair, I, I think... Um, I'm expecting Bitcoin to be between 25 to 35 throughout this year because the fact that um, there are a lot of, um, like I said earlier, there are a lot of um, parameters that you need to consider. And the fact that regulation is tightening, you can see what's happening at the world largest um, crypto exchange. Binance is facing regulations from different quarters and is not going to receive because uh, what we are seeing next is that um, crypto assets are, other, uh, are facing regulation at uh, record levels. And you can see that some founders are already charged for. Uh, selling unregularized securities. So um, you're seeing that at, at a point like this, the market will have to self-correct. And before we see that kind of rally, it will take a couple of months because investors need to be um, aware of the situation based on regulatory narratives. Although news is coming that Apple is about to invest in Bitcoin, but we, we, we don't see any credibility in that because Apple is known for uh, very secretive measures, and uh, they don't see, they don't, they don't uh, invest in risky assets because the fact that they have over 158 billion dollars in the cash and pounds suggests that they should consider this asset. But they're known for investing very conservative instruments, so the market can't uh, seem to see anything exciting now. But you can never can tell, you know. Yes. All right, Limited. Thank you so much. Uh, let's hope the bulls can get some catalysts at this point. All right, Nia, that's how the market is looking right now. Yeah, well, from Olubide, it sounds like it's really dull at this time. Oh, yeah. I think this is part of that time where you need to get into the market and get into the whole, get the whole coins or exactly. something and just stay safe and time keep your head down. Do until... some heavy researching mm -hmm, you know, until things long term improve. positions. Yeah. All right, well, there's always going to be up and there's going to always going to be down. Of course. Well, that's it on the program for today. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget, Business Incorporated will be on at 1.30. Then you will get updated stories from the business world and discussions. So do join us at that time. I'm Ini John Mekwa. And I'm Ladi Williams. Thank you for watching.